yes, yes. Hope you're well. Welcome back to my series on legendary political activist James O'Keefe and the organization he runs, Project Veritas. In the last video, we talked about some of the teething problems James O'Keefe went through in his first year flying the flag for citizen journalism. He suffered some major personal embarrassments, but ultimately managed to claw everything back with a highly successful camera sting on public broadcasting organization NPR. In this third episode of our series, we approach something of a turning point in the history of Project Veritas, where James O'Keefe develops the style of his content and the way he conducts undercover operations. We will see Project Veritas braving a bold new frontier, leaving behind its satirical roots to become a serious political action machine, with an important role to play in presidential elections. Without further ado, let's get comfy and catch back up with our boy James. <laughs> I would sue you. You do it again, and I will. The year is 2014. Obama is two years into his second term as president of the United States, having been re-elected in 2012, and a spate of gang violence in Central America has led to an immigration crisis on the southern border. Immigration authorities are stretched to their capacity, and as reported by a Reuters article, tens of thousands of immigrant children are crossing the border illegally. This issue immediately became a political hot potato in the Houses of Congress. Obama requested $3.7 billion to set up new detention facilities, conduct aerial surveillance, and hire new legislative workers. But Republicans were reluctant to approve this request, alleging that Obama himself had caused the migration crisis by not being tough enough on illegal immigration. Fox News was pretty quick to cover this story, and Janine Pirro, well known for her thoughtful, well-considered, and precise analyses of geopolitical events, explained to her viewers that the crisis was a plot manufactured by the Obama administration to Trojan horse left-wing voters into the country. I draw but one conclusion. Barack Obama is intentionally using the immigration crisis as an excuse to change the demographics and ultimately the electorate of this nation. Yes, a Trojan horse using children to advance his political party, his agenda, and his legacy. In this time of great political turmoil in the US Houses of Congress and heightened fear of foreign invasion across America's heartlands, James O'Keefe identified a perfect opportunity to shine a light on the weakness of Obama's border policy. Here in West Texas, the border is just a muddy sliver of river. This border is not secure. No one is on watch. Even Osama bin Laden could cross. The Project Veritas border crossing video takes a very different approach to the one we're used to seeing from James. This is not an undercover camera operation, but rather a classic man on the ground location report. James travels to a part of the US-Mexico border where the fence abruptly ends, and nothing but a flimsy gate stands in the way of illegal immigrants looking to sneak into the country. He speaks to a local sheriff about how unsafe this is, and vividly emphasizes the point by walking across the muddy river from Mexico to the US himself, just as an undocumented immigrant would. I'm about to cross a 15, maybe 20 foot wide river and cross into the United States just like many illegal immigrants do, and uh, we'll see how this goes. Not too challenging. And I'm in the United States. My man was very close to falling flat on his face there. And if you thought that demonstration of crossing the border was concerning, wait till you see James do it again. But this time, dressed like Osama bin Laden. And if, if they can cross, anybody can cross. And I'm here today to ask you, do you feel safe? Powerful stuff. Now, there's quite a lot to unpack from this video. The first question which is worth asking straight off the bat is how accurately does this video reflect the real border security issues the US was facing at the time James was recording in 2014? Reading the news reports from both left-wing and right-wing outlets which were released at the time, there's a particular area of the border which everyone seems to constantly refer to as the epicenter of the explosion in illegal crossings, Rio Grande Valley. From official Border Patrol data, we can see that the number of apprehensions in Rio Grande Valley jumped from 97,762 in 2012 all the way up to 256,393 in 2014. 
a massive increase of 150%, and by far and away, this was and still is the worst section of the US border for illegal crossings. The thing about the Rio Grande Valley border area is that if you were to judge it by the metrics James proposes in his Project Veritas video, i.e. how big the barrier is, how difficult the river is to cross, and how many border guards are visible in the media area, then the Rio Grande Valley section should be, by all accounts, extremely secure. But the data does not tell that story. The thought that this should lead you on to is that there are clearly more considerations than the ones shown in James's video, which end up determining how vulnerable these border sections actually are. The area James was in was Hudspeth County, an area in the landlocked El Paso section of the US border. Looking at the aerial view of the area which James O'Keefe is in on Google Maps, you immediately notice a significant landscape detail on the Mexican side of the border. A pretty large mountain range with no roads leading over it. In order to reach the shallow area of the muddy river where James is standing, an undocumented immigrant will be forced to undertake a 100 mile trek across the Mexican mountain range on foot. That was just about the easiest thing I ever did. And it may be difficult to get all the way from South America to that point, but crossing that river, no problem. I mean, yeah. If we glaze over the difficulty of scaling the mountain, then yeah, walking over that little muddy river is pretty simple. Uh, let's see what would happen next. And I'm gonna begin walking all the way to I-10 and uh, we'll see if anyone gets in my way. It's a six mile walk from where I crossed over the Rio Grande in the United States to here. When we looked on the US Customs and Border Protection website, we were intrigued by what we read. Undaunted by scorching desert heat or freezing northern winters, they work tirelessly as vigilant protectors of our nation's borders. Not exactly true where we were, not by a mile, or two, or three. James shows himself reaching into State 10 and says that his experience of trekking across terrain disproves the claim that patrol guards are working vigilantly to protect the nation. The natural inference one might make from this is that James didn't see any border patrol units whilst making his journey to the interstate. But if you were to watch a subsequent interview recorded by James, you'd hear him reporting something else which contradicts the implication of his video. We did get into the desert on the way to I-10, and we saw in the, in the very distance, maybe like a couple miles away, we saw a federal border patrol agent. So we decided, I took the camera guy, and I said, let's go let's go talk to the border patrol. And we drove up to the Florida border patrol agents, and they scurried away. They saw us approach, and they drove away. So maybe it was the Wait, camera. They James did come across some border patrol guards on his way across the desert, who saw him with his cameraman, got spooked, and consequently drove away, presumably to avoid being interviewed. This encounter is never mentioned in the Project Veritas video, so the viewer has no way of knowing that there were guards stationed in the exact area James was walking through, who I'm guessing would have apprehended him quite quickly had he not been an obvious New Jersey guy in a shirt and slacks being filmed by a cameraman. But the problem here is not only important information being withheld from viewers, but also a deliberate dishonest framing of events. It's a six mile walk from where I crossed over the Rio Grande in the United States to here. The hike that James did from the border to the interstate was six miles long. Keeping in mind that the journey is six miles long, listen to the way that James words this next passage. They work tirelessly as vigilant protectors of our nation's borders. Not exactly true where we were, not by a mile, or two, or three. This is an example of incredibly deceptive framing, where James can leave his viewers with a false impression of events without ever explicitly lying to them. James says that he didn't see any border guards for one mile or two miles or three miles and leaves it there. He deliberately stops short of describing what happened during mile number four or five or six, but the lexicon he uses makes it sound like those three miles are representative of the full journey. He is lying by omission, but if challenged, he has wriggle room to say that his words were only ever intended to describe half the journey to the interstate, and if the viewer came to a false conclusion from the way he worded things, that's their problem, not his. After arriving at the interstate, James declares that he is now free to go wherever he wants in the United States. From here I can get anywhere in the United States. I would challenge this. Looking at a map of the interstate where James is standing, there appears to be border checkpoints in every possible direction. Driving to freedom would surely rely on getting past them without being detected at any point. Moreover, James's presumption relies on the fact that undocumented immigrants who've crossed the border have access to transport which they can get from here, which certainly isn't guaranteed. In fact, there's a piece which was published by Fox News in 2013, just one year before James released his Project Veritas video, entitled 
Fort Hancock, Texas, where a fence and hope for illegals ends. This article describes how immigrants who cross James O'Keefe's muddy river section of the border end up slap bang in the middle of nowhere and take to wandering the desert for days, often dying due to thirst and starvation. The article suggests that the prevailing pattern in the area James is filming in is not for undocumented immigrants to reach the highway and drive to freedom as James has suggested, but rather for them to cross the highway on foot and get lost in the barren wasteland on the other side. All of these factors combined, the mountain range on the Mexican side of the border, the acres of desert, the isolated towns, make this area not particularly popular amongst immigrants looking to illegally cross into the country. Let's bring up the data we looked at before, illustrating the huge number of apprehensions in the Rio Grande Valley section of the US border during the migrant crisis of 2014. I'm now going to show you the number of apprehensions in the El Paso section of the border, which contains the area where James O'Keefe filmed his Project Veritas report. Okay, so it starts significantly lower than the Rio Grande Valley data, but this is before the spike in 2011, so let's see what happens from there. Doesn't look like it's been affected yet, but the real migrant crisis was in 2014, so it's probably going to spike massively then. Oh, whilst in the Rio Grande Valley section of the border, apprehensions increased by 200,000 between 2012 and 2014, in the El Paso section of the border, there was a very slight increase of just under 3,000. And bear in mind, the data for the El Paso section of the border is not just the area James is in, but the entire El Paso region, which contains other, bigger points of entry for illegal immigrants, like El Paso City, which doesn't require trekking over a big mountain range to access. It's somewhat curious that during a time when immigrants were illegally crossing the US border in record numbers, James chose to do a Project Veritas investigation in a region which was completely unaffected by the crisis. So, with illegal border crossings being so high elsewhere, why did James choose to film in this area? Well, what Hudspeth County lacks in empirical border crossings, it more than makes up for in shorthand visual cues which convey vulnerability at the border to undiscerning viewers. It's got this fence that abruptly stops, this little barrier that James can dissemble by hand, this shallow river. When taken out of their wider geographical context, these are useful visual tools for portraying Obama's borders as lawless, wide open spaces which undocumented immigrants and terrorists can walk straight through. The sheriff who James O'Keefe featured in his video, Arvin West, has recently expressed dissatisfaction with Trump's border wall proposal, saying it will have little impact because his section of the border already has a natural barrier which is all but impassable. He's quoted in this article from The Independent saying, they're not listening to us, they haven't asked us to begin with. It doesn't make a shit of difference who's in office, he continued, criticizing Republicans and Democrats. They're not gonna listen to us, they don't care to listen to us. The irony of James O'Keefe's sensationalist approach to border journalism, where he presents the gap in the Hudspeth County fence as an existential threat to the security of all Americans, is that all of his criticisms can now be directed towards Mr. Borders himself, Donald Trump. The Hudspeth County border area is so low down the priority list that in four years of being president, Trump has done absolutely nothing to extend the fence. A progress report on Trump's border wall undertaken by the Washington Post in February of this year shows that construction work in the Hudspeth County area has been deprioritized by the Trump administration in favor of other stretches which are considered to be more essential, such as the downtown area of El Paso City, Rio Grande Valley, and Tucson. That was just about the easiest thing I ever did. I'm in the United States. Let me tell you something, if the president or if Senator Reid or anyone else tries to tell you that our borders are secure, they are lying to you. Our borders are secure. It's the people on top, it's the people in Washington that are giving the orders to them. The president and the Senate and the Congress are, are lying to people. They're, they're just, it's just, the lies are so obvious this, at this point. I mean, to have Senator Reid look into the, the American people's eyes and say the border's secure. Our borders are secure. And these statements are just not true, man, according to what we show. The video speaks for itself. It's just a disgusting, it's a disgrace. It's, it's, it's right. violating everything. It's, it's basically a violation of his duty to protect our country. If James O'Keefe truly cared about the dishonesty of the government regarding the open section of the border in Hudspeth County, as much as he seemed to when Barack Obama was president, it would be logical for him to speak out about how Donald Trump is lying to the American people. However, as we'll explore in the next chapter of this video, James O'Keefe and Donald Trump have something of a friendly relationship, which means that just like contextual information in his videos, James will suppress his criticisms. You are dirty.
James Aki first met with Donald Trump in 2013. At this time, Donald Trump was gaining notoriety in the media for casting doubt on President Barack Obama's legitimacy to be the leader of the United States, suggesting that Obama may have been born in another country and faked his American birth certificate. At his first meeting with James O'Keefe, Trump wanted James to help him obtain Obama's old college papers from Columbia University because he thought they might prove that Obama had fabricated claims about his nationality in order to get a free scholarship. Ultimately, it's a request which James wasn't in a position to fulfill as it fell outside of his area of expertise. However, in his reflections on the encounter, James writes about having a realization of how useful Donald Trump could be to him. As the events of 2016 proved, Trump and I had something fundamental in common. Not so much a shared ideology as a shared adversary. The adversary we shared was a powerful one, which might well be called the deep state media complex. Like Trump, Project Veritas is a disruptor. On leaving Trump Tower, it never crossed my mind that one day Trump will be president. I did think, however, he could make one hell of an ally. It's in the summer of 2015 that the alliance between James O'Keefe and Donald Trump really comes together. Trump was on the cusp of announcing his candidacy to become president, and he invited James O'Keefe to his headquarters in Trump Tower to speak about how much media impact Project Veritas could achieve for him with their undercover videos in the presidential election. This signaled the beginning of a new phase for James O'Keefe, where he began to undertake long-term undercover operations which were quite different in character to the ones he'd done in the past. Previously, James O'Keefe had relied on quick wins, one-time meetings arranged with video targets which had been meticulously scripted and recorded to procure a few minutes worth of incriminating footage. But James O'Keefe realized that if he could fully embed his reporters as employees in the organizations his targets worked in, he would have hours and hours of recorded footage to choose from. In the company of their trusted co-workers, James's targets would open up more and say more stuff. And every single inappropriate joke, vulgar comment or naive utterance could be weaponized against them for political gain. The new directive, which was issued for the 2016 elections, was for Project Veritas reporters to infiltrate the offices where Democrats and left-wing campaigners worked, gaining access to their innermost circles to record days and days worth of footage, which would be relayed back to James at Project Veritas headquarters every evening. In order to pull off these infiltrations, James was looking for a particular type of undercover reporter. He sought out people who are dogmatic, ruthless, and utterly devoted to the Project Veritas cause. One such person is Alison Mass, who James hired in 2015. During her time at college, Alison had been the editor of a conservative paper called the Minnesota Republic, which came under fire from its funding committee for images it had published five years prior, deemed to be culturally insensitive. Rather than agreeing to refrain from publishing such images in the future, Alison fought back publicly on the site Campus Reform, punching back at the college funding committee with an article entitled, You Can't Make Fun of Terrorists at the University of Minnesota. In his book, James describes this as the incident that made him think Alison would be a good fit for Project Veritas, and he invited her to work for him uniquely based on her willingness to use conservative media to punch the establishment. Another, more prominent example of an undercover journalist who worked for Project Veritas is Laura Loomer. This is some footage of Laura doing a publicity stunt in 2017 during the staging of a play of Julius Caesar, which satirically depicted the lead as a caricature of Donald Trump. Freedom. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to pause. We're going to pause. Security, security, please. Now, look what happens as Laura starts being escorted out. Right on cue, her associate Jack Posobiec appears on camera. He's been filming the whole thing live on Periscope and is about to start yelling at the liberals in the audience, telling them that they are Nazis. You are all Goebbels! You are all Nazis like Joseph Goebbels! This is Goebbels! You are all Goebbels! You are inciting terrorists! It's an all too perfectly orchestrated publicity stunt made to show conservatives as oppressed victims in a world where everything is stacked against them, very much in the spirit of Project Veritas journalism. When James O'Keefe is scouting undercover reporters, he looks for people who are just like Laura Loomer, tenacious, daring, willing to put themselves on the front lines, but perhaps most importantly of all, James O'Keefe seeks out people who are desperate to change the world, who want to use media tools to reshape public opinion and align it with their political ideology. James O'Keefe goes into more detail explaining the psychology that Project Veritas undercover reporters have during his appearance on my favorite YouTube talk show, The Rubin Report. Most people that do this, most insiders inside these companies coming to us, now have what I call a justice complex. They think that there are things wrong with the world and they feel compelled 
to do something about it. It's hard to explain. These people are willing to basically jump on a grenade to wear a camera, to film their employer, in some cases violating their own non-disclosure agreement, because they believe the public has a right to know. The people James hires, as he puts it, have a justice complex. They see things that are wrong with the world, and they do whatever it takes to expose those things. In the case of Laura Loomer, something she saw as being wrong with the world in 2017 was the fact that too many Uber and Lyft drivers were Muslim, which prevented her from arriving at her conference on time because she wasn't prepared to use any taxis which were driven by Muslims. Just as James O'Keefe explained, you can see some of Laura's specific worldview coming to life in her work for Project Veritas, such as in this video, where she exposed the fact that Muslims can commit voter fraud by hiding their faces with burqas. In essence, the Project Veritas justice complex, which all their undercover reporters share, is directly symmetrical to the social justice complex which you can observe amongst left-wing students on college campuses. People who go to work as undercover journalists for James O'Keefe have dogmatic beliefs about things which must be fixed in society, and they're utterly committed to using their undercover camera work to persuade viewers to feel the same way, by any means necessary. You know, I feel like I'm in Nazi Germany. I honestly do. I feel like I'm in Nazi Germany. During the 2016 election, James O'Keefe implemented a grand strategy which can be likened to a trick which I saw the British illusionist Darren Brown doing on TV when I was younger. In this trick, Darren Brown says to the audience that he's going to flip a coin 10 times and the coin will land on heads every single time. A feat which is statistically close to impossible. But then, as the audience, you're amazed as he starts flipping the coin and you see heads, 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 over and over again, 10 heads in a row without breaking a sweat. When you're watching this, you're like, rah, how'd he do that? And later in the program, he reveals that this footage which was showed to you was just one successful attempt he'd made to flip 10 heads in a row amongst thousands of other failed attempts. Darren Brown spent literally all day filming while he repeatedly tried and failed over and over and over again. And he eventually succeeded after nine hours by pure statistical probability and perseverance. When you see the one clip in isolation, you're under the impression that Darren has demonstrated something extraordinary, but he's actually secured this fixed outcome by putting in hours of practical work that the audience never got a chance to see. This was, more or less, the approach that James O'Keefe took to the 2016 election. He planted many undercover reporters in multiple Democrat campaigns, banking on the fact that with 24-7 access to the campaign staff and every undercover reporter trained to steer conversations towards inflammatory comments, he was bound to produce the results he needed to help Donald Trump win the presidential race. Just like Darren Brown with his coin trick, James O'Keefe was committed to doing so many takes that he would statistically guarantee himself results. A few of James's undercover reporters had their covers blown and were told to pack their bags and fuck off. A notable example is Alison Mass, who gave the fake name Alison Moss when signing up to volunteer for the Russ Feingold campaign. When Feingold's staff looked her up, they found a Facebook page which appeared to have been created just two days prior to Alison turning up at their office. She was then retroactively clocked as someone who'd been volunteering for the Bernie Sanders campaign. However, James O'Keefe could hand wave away every failed mission as collateral damage given how many irons he had in the fire. For each one of his undercover reporters who were exposed, he had two more already embedded in campaigns or waiting in the wings ready to take their places. Arguably the biggest embarrassment James O'Keefe suffered throughout the entire course of the 2016 election was something which he inflicted completely upon himself. One of James O'Keefe's big targets for the 2016 election was billionaire philanthropist George Soros. Soros made his money in stock trading and investments in the years leading up to the millennium and has become known as an almost satirically demonic figure amongst the political right because of his prolific donations to left-wing organizations and causes. In the discourse of modern day conservatism, his name comes up often and is always pronounced with the same disdainful tone. As you may know, the 85-year-old billionaire is a far-left fanatic. As the curtain goes up on those Trump-hating, Soros-loving socialists. George Soros is a billionaire, but somehow how his own money isn't enough to fund the totality of his anti-American agenda. Given that George Soros was the big left-wing counterweight to all of James O'Keefe's right-wing billionaire donors who funneled their millions of dollars into Project Veritas, James knew that there was a lot to be gained financially and politically if he could successfully sting George Soros's Open Society Foundation. So, he concocted a classic Project Veritas scheme. You sons of bitches! The plan was simple. 
James O'Keefe would pose as a Hungarian donor and make contact with the Open Society Foundation purporting to want to make a significant financial contribution to their program. When the Open Society Foundation took the bait, James would arrange a financial transaction from a dubious source to entrap them into breaking their own ethical codes. Subsequently, he would invite an elderly man from the UK with a thick British accent to play the role of a trustee and send him to a meeting with the Open Society Foundation wearing a secret hidden camera to capture them talking about their left-wing agenda, leading them right into a trap of their own greedy making. Following the meeting, James would weaponized the content he'd captured, creating a powerful tool which could be used to smear Soros and any Democrat candidates who'd received money from him, who would now be heavily tainted by any associations. So, James picks up the phone and dials the number of the Open Society Foundation to execute phase one of the plan. It was, I believe, March 16th. It was pretty quiet and I was just kind of hunkering down and getting through my work when I noticed that my phone was ringing and a number I, I wasn't familiar with uh, popped up, and so I let it go to voicemail. Hi, you have reached Dana Garrity with the Eurasia Program at the Open Society Foundations. I'm not available right now, so please leave a message, and I'll get back to you shortly. Hey, Dana, my name is uh, Victor Kesh. I'm a it was a call from a, a Victor Kesh, who apparently was a Hungarian-American citizen who worked for a foundation. I'm representing a foundation that would uh, like to get involved with you guys. And um, so I was a bit kind of suspicious about that because when you call, you identify the actual foundation you work for. Fighting for um, for uh, uh, European values and, and some other issues. And I'm an American citizen, but uh, uh, dual citizenship, Hungarian-American who uh, wants to aid and, and give me a call back when you can. Thank you. And then uh, there was a pause and he kind of stated under his breath um, to, to not talk until he hung up the phone. Don't say anything right the phone. And I heard him begin to discuss in a very different tone, actually, um, with his colleagues about what had just happened, what he wanted them to do, what their plan was going forward. What, what needs to happen is someone other than me needs to make 100 phone calls like that. After making the fraudulent call where he posed as a Hungarian donor named Victor Kesh, James forgot to hang up the phone. So Dana Jerry is sitting at her desk listening in confusion while James then talks through the whole plan of how he intends to trick her into accepting an illegal donation, discussing the whole thing with four Project Veritas colleagues by his side. I'm not sure whether there's a specialized term for this in the undercover journalism game, but from where I'm from, we would call this a massive L. <laughs> On the call where James has forgotten to hang up the phone, he then commits a further blunder by typing in Dana Gerrity's name on LinkedIn. Dana Lee Gary, Open Society Foundation, there she is. Now, LinkedIn is different to other social networking sites in that when you click on someone's profile, that person immediately gets a notification saying that you have viewed their profile. So Dana is now not only hearing James O'Keefe directly talking about her on the phone, she can also see this notification popping up on her screen on LinkedIn saying James O'Keefe is looking at her. Not long after these absolute shenanigans, James O'Keefe received a call from Jane Mayer, a journalist at The New Yorker. When I first called James O'Keefe asking if he had any idea who Victor Kesh was, he acted like he was mystified. He said, Victor Cash? Victor Cash. And then he said he had no interest in discussing this or talking about any investigations or operations that were, as he put it, uh, real or imagined. But when I kept reporting and made clear to him that I actually had a copy of the tape of his phone call, he then decided to put the best face on it and publicly confess. Jane Mayer's call to James O'Keefe made him explicitly aware that his sting had been rumbled. Not only this, but he now knew that the New Yorker had a whole tape recording of him forgetting to hang up and laying out all of his plans to sting George Soros' Open Society Foundation. James was now anxious about the embarrassing articles which were going to be published about him, not just because he would lose face with Project Veritas viewers and supporters, but also because the billionaires who'd placed their money and trust in him would be reading these articles and might just reconsider ever investing again. If you're someone who follows the work of Project Veritas, you'll be aware that James O'Keefe has a staunch rule when it comes to news reporting. He only reports things if you can see and hear them come out of a person's own mouth. 
I don't report anything unless you can hear and see it come out of the person's own mouth. However, faced with the pressure of embarrassment from a failed sting operation, James decided that it was now ethically justified to break this Project Veritas golden rule. And within a ridiculously short time frame, he put together a highly derogatory video about George Soros' Open Society Foundation and their evil doings across the Western world. So, Soros is all about accountability, and the Open Society Institute is all about accountability. So we're going to hold the organization accountable by talking to every single person that walks out of their office. So you've got a coordinated effort by the political opposition to spin this very, very false narrative, and I think Soros is behind it. Tiermond and others believe George Soros and his foundation have funded radical movements both foreign and domestic including Black Lives Matter and others. Having failed in his attempt to infiltrate the Open Society Foundation, James has nothing to report here, apart from allegations about George Soros secretly organizing radical agitprop movements to subvert Western democracy. But report the allegations James O'Keefe does, relying on the testimony of this gentleman called Matthew Tiermond. Matthew Tiermond is a journalist. He's also an analyst of Poland's political landscape. He also sits on the board of Project Veritas. Love this intro for Matthew Tiermond journalist, analyst of Poland's political landscape, and guy who sits on the desk opposite James O'Keefe in the office at Project Veritas. Yes, the person who's making these allegations about George Soros as a credible voice of reason is just one of James's own colleagues. I suppose it makes sense given that James only had a day to shoot this. James is visibly rattled and on edge in this video, presumably because he feels hard done by in the wake of Soros' organization unfairly getting the better of him. Most of the runtime of this video is taken up by footage of James and his mate from work, Matthew, accosting people on the street, asking them if they work at the Open Society Foundation, and presenting their reluctance to speak to them as a sign of their inherent dishonesty. Hi, are you Dana? Are you Dana Garrity at Open Society Foundations? Do I fucking look like Dana Garrity? Do you what? Almost every individual that I've spoken with claims not to work there or claims to be a temporary employee or an intern. Not very transparent. They say it's all about transparency. Doesn't seem that way. As we saw today, there's no transparency. Embedded in the middle of the video is an admission from James that he was trying to sting the Open Society Foundation in a scheme and that his efforts were thwarted. So he finds a way to break the news of his failure to his fans on his own terms. In my view, this video has two pretty transparent aims. The first is to counteract some of the embarrassment and humiliation James suffered at the hands of the Open Society Foundation by manufacturing a new situation where James once again holds all the cards and is fully in control. A fearless citizen journalist with a righteous cause asking hard-hitting questions to people in power. Even if those people in power are just Kevin who works in IT and he's on his way out of the office to get a bagel for lunch or something. The other aim of this video is to poison the well, portraying workers of the Open Society Foundation as inherently corrupt, ill-intentioned and spineless people so that James can shape the narrative ahead of his audience finding out what actually happened on his botched phone call. After seeing this, even when Project Veritas viewers hear news of James's incompetence, they will still be sympathetic to his aims given the unfavorable portrait which he paints of the enemy. Do me a favor, just take your head out of the left-right political dichotomy for a second and listen to the way that Dana Gerrity, who James tried to sting, actually talks about this incident. I think maybe the reason, I mean this is just pure speculation, but perhaps the reason he chose a Hungarian identity is because George Soros is also of Hungarian descent and is a Hungarian American. She's chill. She finds it mildly amusing. This isn't political war to Dana Gerrity, it's just a funny story of something that happened while she was at work. She's not trying to proclaim victory over a staunch right-wing enemy or decry James O'Keefe as some kind of dangerous agitator. By contrast, James O'Keefe, who is the one who started this whole thing and failed because of his own blunder, is now using his platform to publicly shame random employees of the Open Society Foundation, airing their faces and names all to salvage his own damaged ego. It's extremely odd behavior from a journalist whose mission statement is creating a more ethical and transparent society. The top comments on this retaliation video paint a pretty clear picture that James O'Keefe has achieved his desired effect. They all seem to think that Dana and her colleagues are like minions of Satan. What's interesting is that when James's hidden camera operations succeed, he often uses this cool and calm discourse of exposing truth, of reporting only what can be objectively observed and substantiated by video evidence. We don't moralize. The medium is so pure. It's the purest 
type of reporting. And what other okay. journalists do is is try to contextualize and add moralism to it. Our stuff is is hard fact. It's it's hard fact. However, when James O'Keefe fails to sting his targets and has no hard facts on video to present, but feels threatened, he can always resort to plan B, which is to use his platform and hundreds of thousands of followers to disseminate allegations against his targets, defaming and vilifying them before they even get the chance to tell their side of the story. The undercover operation, which ultimately produced results for James O'Keefe during the 2016 election, was one which was conducted by one of his most loyal reporters, Christian Hartsock, who'd been working for James since 2010. Hello, I'm Christian Hartsock. I'm a filmmaker. Um, I'm of a generation that is influenced mostly by pop culture. Uh, it's a very liberal generation. I think the reason for that is, is because we as conservatives have allowed for generations uh, for the left to define who we are via pop culture. During his years working for Project Veritas, Christian was also a journalist at Breitbart News, where he would sometimes write articles celebrating the successes of Project Veritas, basically giving himself a massive pat on the back. When James writes about Christian in his book, he uses the fake name Steve Packard. The passages of James O'Keefe's book, which describes Steve's journey to retrieving footage for him, quite aptly spell out the pressures which are placed on Project Veritas journalists during their undercover missions and the tactics they're forced to use. Steve began his journey by volunteering to canvas on the streets with a series of different progressive groups, handing out flyers and knocking on doors for the Democrats. After a whole week of doing this, he is unsuccessful in catching any of them saying anything incriminating on tape. James writes, To this point, at least to the degree that anyone let Steve see, none of the canvassers had done anything illegal. Frustrated by his lack of useful video, Steve called us on primary day, April 5th. He wanted to share his concerns and brainstorm some possible avenues of attack. We encourage our journalists to be innovative, and Steve was certainly that. During our conversation, he proposed an 11th hour gambit that popped into his head while we were speaking. It would prove enormously fruitful. Note the language which is used in this passage here by James when he describes Steve's objectives. The thing that Steve is most frustrated by is his lack of useful video. The phrasing suggests that Steve's mission might be more about obtaining footage which is of use to James, i.e. footage which will help Republicans win the election, than reporting any objective reality that he's finding in his life as an unpaid volunteer campaigner for the Democrats. Steve decides that in order to get James the useful footage he needs, he'll have to deliberately manufacture an illegal scheme of his own and see if he can engage his fellow Democrat workers in conversation about it. A strategy which shifts the focus from trying to uncover illegal activity to proposing illegal activity and seeing if anyone will humor him. Steve's plan is to suggest to his colleagues that they create fake IDs and bust their activists around to different states with the fake IDs in order to fraudulently obtain more votes for the Democrats. If any of Steve's Democrat colleagues take him up on this plan or even discuss any aspects of the plan with him, Steve will instantly have the useful footage he needs for James, Democrats on camera talking about committing voter fraud, all made possible by some clever conversation engineering from Steve and a little touch of Project Veritas magic. So, Steve starts proposing his illegal scheme to a bunch of the people he's volunteering with, but in James's words, they weren't biting. It's when Steve attends after work drinks with his colleagues at a local bar and people are getting a bit drunk, i.e. a situation which always serves to massively benefit Project Veritas, that Steve finds the target he's been looking for, Scott Fovel. I have paid off a few homeless guys to do some crazy stuff, and I've also taken them for dinner, and I've also made uh -huh. sure they had a hotel and a, and a shower, and I put them in a program. Scott Fovel was a political operative for the Democratic Party who was coordinating some of their campaign efforts on the ground. He's described in James's book as being cocky and boastful, someone who liked to talk. A perfect person for Steve to pitch his voter fraud plan to. When Steve tells Scott Fovel his plan, Scott Fovel responds to him, highlighting the ways in which the authorities might find out about it and hypothesizing ideas about how Steve could avoid their detection methods. It's one thing if all these people drive up in their personal cars. There's a bus involved? Uh, that changes the dynamic. So it's the legality. Uh, well, yeah. 
You can prove conspiracy if there's a bus. Yeah. If there are cars, it's much harder to prove. And there's enough money. Well, you can't have them with Wisconsin license plates because rentals here, most of them don't have Wisconsin license plates. But there's this thing called the used car auction. Ah. Ah. Used car auction. The titles belong to some unknown company. They're company cars. Now, first thing to note, which I think is somewhat important to be aware of, listen to Scott slurring over his words at the end here. There are cars, it's much harder to prove. And Alcohol has definitely played a role in boosting Scott's willingness to entertain this conversation. The next thing to note, and something which I consider to be of much greater consequence, is the way that James frames this conversation to his audience. In this video, Democratic operatives tell us how to successfully commit voter fraud on a massive scale. The plan that was discussed was how to bring people from one state into another state to vote illegally. James O'Keefe says that Democratic operatives have told his reporter how to successfully commit voter fraud on a massive scale, and that a plan was discussed which involves bringing voters from one state into another to vote illegally. Now, you know, because of the context I've given you, that there's a very big piece of information which has been withheld from the audience here. And it's the fact that the whole illegal voter fraud scheme is the creation of Project Veritas, and that they are the ones proposing it to Scott Fovel during this encounter. Scott Fovel is simply reacting to Steve's voter fraud plan and commenting on different aspects of it, the parts he thinks would hypothetically work for Steve and the other parts which he thinks wouldn't. James only shows the audience Scott Fovel's part of the conversation, with only very rare inputs from Steve, so there's no way of the audience discerning this context from the video. The only reason that you know about this is because there was a legal investigation into this one year later, and James O'Keefe wrote about it in his book two years later. Now, this is another classic example of a criticism which James O'Keefe can easily slap away, saying, where's the lie though? Democratic operatives did tell our reporter how to commit voter fraud. A plan was discussed, which involves bringing voters from one state to another to vote illegally. But let's not be silly. There's a reason why James has withheld key information about the way this thing was conducted from his audience. Without knowing that Project Veritas are the instigators of the voter fraud scheme, the logical abstraction that the audience makes from watching this video is not that Scott Fovel entertained a conversation about voter fraud on one occasion, but rather that there is a voter fraud plan already in motion within the DNC, which the Democrats were already planning to commit, and James's reporter uncovered it. This inference, though false, is an incredibly helpful one for James to propagate, as it better achieves his goal of portraying corruption at the heart of the Democratic campaign, and that is something that will get Republicans elected. James also shows his audience this clip. It's a very easy thing for Republicans to say, well, they're busting people in. Well, you know what? We've been busting people in to deep fucking asshole for 50 years, and we're not going to stop now. We're just going to find a different way to do it. Scott Fovel says that the Democrats are bussing people in, and they've been doing it for 30 years. Again, there's a seemingly logical inference to be made here, that Democrats are committing voter fraud by bussing people in from out of state and have been doing it for years. This was certainly the assumption made by all the major media outlets who reported on James's videos at the time of their release. But James's book, released two years later, has a passage which contradicts this reading. It features a quote from Scott Fovel, which wasn't included in the Rigging the Election videos. This is Scott Fovel speaking as quoted by James. There was a decision by the National Labour Council to not send a huge army of people here for activism because it would have actually added to Walker's narrative that these powerful Labour bosses were running Wisconsin. And that was, I think, a mistake. Named in the passage is Scott Walker, a Republican senator who claimed that union bosses had too much power in Wisconsin. In this quote, Scott Fovel is explicitly talking about Democrats being reluctant to bus union workers in for activism purposes, i.e. knocking on doors and getting people out to vote, because it would have lent weight to Scott Walker's claims. Fovel explicitly states here that they were bussing in a huge army of people for activism, not illegal voting. Once again, it's a clip which, when divorced from context, leads the audience and the media to false conclusions, and those false conclusions are massively helpful to James's cause. The year after the video, Scott Fovel tried to respond to Project Veritas in a local Wisconsin paper, saying, 
I was referring to busing people to rallies, because transportation is a major issue when you're taking people out to places like Waukesha. Project Veritas executive director shot back at him the blatant honesty, I'm pretty sure he means dishonesty, the blatant dishonesty by Fovel and others as to the dirty tricks and voter fraud that they had participated in warrants investigation by legal authorities. By the way, that legal investigation which was warranted happened and we'll be discussing it shortly. The other video which James released was focused on comments made by Scott Fovel and fellow DNC employee Bob Creamer about sending political operatives to Trump rallies in order to rile up Trump supporters. This is something we can discuss in greater detail when we get to the legal investigation. The Project Veritas DNC videos were released on YouTube in October 2016. Given the nature of YouTube as a social sharing platform, to the unsuspecting observer, the sudden appearance of these videos seemed quite spontaneous and organic, but actually it was an extremely calculated drop, precisely timed just ahead of the final presidential debate between Trump and Clinton one month before the election. Ahead of the release of the videos, James O'Keefe called all of his contacts in conservative media to ensure that they would help him traffic the videos all over the web. Those who received a personal link from James included the head editors at Breitbart.com, Joel Pollack and Alexander Marlowe, conservative media mogul Matt Drudge, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity at Fox News, alt-light YouTube personality Gavin McGuinness, and Lee Habib, the vice president of a network of 22 conservative Christian radio stations across the country. James O'Keefe also alerted the subreddit The Donald that he would be dropping something explosive soon and that they should keep their eyes peeled. In case you weren't aware, before it recently got banned, The Donald was an online Reddit forum for hardcore fans of Donald Trump, where they posted memes like this. We're gonna go build our own Reddit with Trump and winners. Very worryingly, 100% of people who saw this meme in The Donald upvoted it. In his book, James O'Keefe writes that he felt very at home in The Donald and describes how much he appreciated their steady stream of strong, encouraging messages to him. However, when James finally released the videos at lunchtime on October 17th, in the hours which preceded, he was not happy with the way things were going. The videos were getting shares from his fans on social media, but he needed the videos to make it onto cable news in order for them to be politically effective. Eventually, in frustration, he took to YouTube to ask his loyal followers to tweet the videos directly at news anchors. Hi, I'm James O'Keefe here. It's now 3.30 Eastern time. The story has been live for since noon. But here's what I need you to do. I need you to tweet this video, this, this, this DNC and Hillary Clinton inciting violence video. I need you to tweet it at the anchors at places like Fox News, which is one of the corporations. Uh, Brett Baer, Megyn Kelly, uh, Bill O'Reilly, uh, Sean Hannity, tweet this video at them with the hashtag Veritas or bird dogging. And let's get these organizations, these media companies, to overcome their fear and to report the truth because this is big. This is probably the biggest thing we've ever done. We have another one coming tomorrow and we need a groundswell of people to break their dam and to push the water over the dam. This is important, please. Tweet at these people with the hashtag Veritas Bird Dogging. James also used this video to levy a specific accusation against the mainstream media. But let me tell you something. Uh, some sources told me that media corporations are blacklisting this story because they're publicly traded companies and they're afraid of being retaliated and investigated by Hillary Clinton's Department of Justice. Media corporations are not reporting on James's video because they're scared of retaliations from Hillary Clinton's Department of Justice. How does James know this? His sources told him. Some would say that James's use of anonymous sources here to traffic such an extreme accusation is quite irresponsible. Last year, I watched an episode of my favorite TV show, The Rubin Report, where conscientious objector to leftism Dave Rubin and the guest he had on at the time laid out a pretty compelling argument for why journalists should abstain from this practice. I think that journalism has become corrupted due to this over-reliance upon sources, anonymous sources especially. He uses quotes secondhand mm -hmm. from anonymous sources on background, on deep background, mm -hmm. hearsay quotes, I literally remember being in like junior high school and watching CNN and they would say a source on Capitol Hill. And I would always think this is insane. A source on Capitol Hill, anyone can be on Capitol Hill. It could be the guy that's walking his dog on Capitol Hill, who's the janitor for the 
you know, fast food joint. Like, we don't. We don't see. A source we don't. On we don't see Oil. that source's face. Yeah. We don't know what motivates that person. We don't know what words were used we don't by know that, if that source. Person exists. We don't know if that person exists. I mean, can you imagine if I said <laughs> there are sources inside CNN who says that Jeff Zucker <laughs> said they'd call me a liar? Yeah. Let me tell you something. Uh, some sources told me that media corporations are blacklisting this story. Now, a worthwhile question to ask here is. What led James O'Keefe to commit such a big infringement of his own journalistic ethical codes? He puts out a lot of videos, and this level of anxious public begging for likes and shares isn't often something we see from him, certainly not under such conspiratorial pretenses. And in fact, it's not just that, but James's whole shaky demeanor on camera, which is distinctively different to his usual victorious smugness, which we can usually count on seeing when he's just released a new undercover video recording. Of course, given the fact that this was during an election cycle, it was very important to James on a personal level that his DNC videos were seen and shared by as many people as possible. But in my view, the specific anxiety and fragility we see in James here is born out of the fact that it wasn't just on a personal level this time that he needed his videos to gain traction. In James's book, during the passage where he describes his meeting with Trump before the primaries, he writes, when Trump turned back to me, the whole tone of the conversation changed. He was no longer the friendly fan. He was the serious candidate. He asked us how much in earned media we thought he'd netted so far, a month or so into the campaign. Stephen and I both estimated about $100 million. He thought that about right. He knew how the game was played. When James met Trump in 2015, Trump was heavily focused on earned media coverage for his campaign. No doubt, assurances from Project Veritas about how much positive media coverage they could net for Trump with their stings were an important part of his reasoning for working with them in the first place. And I imagine these were also of some significance to Project Veritas's private donors, including think tanks like the Donors Trust and Dunn's Foundation for the Advancement of Right Thinking. The reason why James looks so stressed in this video so nervous, so shaky, is because you're looking at someone who's promised the world to some very powerful corporate and political donors and is now panicking about the consequences of his videos not delivering the results. Following James O'Keefe's public plea and allegations that the mainstream media were actively censoring his DNC videos due to fear of reprisals from Hillary Clinton's Department of Justice, Project Veritas fans shared the rigged DNC videos more proactively than ever before, with many enthusiastic Twitter accounts like this one seemingly tagging every news station and every combination of words they could think of. The cable news anchor who eventually reported on James's videos following this effort was the ever wise, cautious and discerning veteran reporter who America has learned to rely on as a measured voice of reason, Sean Hannity. Oh my God. James O'Keefe's Project Veritas is out with a brand new undercover video tonight that is even more disturbing. Now this new tape seems to show Democratic operatives discussing ways that they could commit voter fraud on a massive scale. Now, Fox News Channel, as we told you last night, has not independently verified the content, but what we see is shocking. Watch this. The support of Fox News eventually led to a wave of attention surrounding James O'Keefe's DNC videos, which gave him the outcome he'd been hoping for. Both Scott Fovel and Bob Creamer resigned from their positions, and once this happened, the videos became a thoroughly newsworthy story in their own right, leading to coverage from mainstream media outlets such as the New York Times and the Washington Post. Amongst those who were happiest with the results of the videos were Donald Trump's campaign staff, who called Project Veritas HQ and invited James O'Keefe down to attend the presidential debate as their guest. At first, James O'Keefe deliberates whether or not he should go, writing, My one concern was of seeming too partisan. However, although it's true that one does run the risk of seeming like a biased journalist when directly collaborating with a political campaign to get their guy elected and in honor of their service to the political campaign getting invited as their guest to insider events, James O'Keefe decides that he will go anyway, and he gets very excited in anticipation of Donald Trump mentioning his videos during the debate. He writes, I'll admit it, I watched the debate itself with a different expectation than the rest of the audience. They cared about how their candidate would perform. I cared about whether Donald Trump would mention our videos. He did not disappoint. When Donald Trump mentions the Project Veritas videos, James O'Keefe, absolutely overjoyed, sends out this tweet. Our video journalism was just brought up in the presidential debates. That's one small step us, one giant leap for citizen journalism. 
Although this is a very happy moment, James is a little bit crestfallen afterwards in the spin room where none of the media pay any attention to him. He writes, Then the really awkward part began. I and the others strolled around the red carpet taking questions from the literally hundreds of media gathered there. To be more specific, the others took questions. I just strolled around looking stupid. Laura, our social media specialist, was watching from afar. Why aren't you talking to people? She texted me. The real reason, I asked, was why were they not talking to me? I suspect they were unwilling to give our cause any more airtime than they absolutely had to. From their perspective, no question they might ask would result in a politically useful answer, so better not to ask any questions at all. Here I was, with the hottest video in America, one that the president addressed during the debate, one that all the anchors talked about that evening, and the reporters treated me as though I had head lice. As I passed, some of them looked down, some looked away. Remember the friendly Norwegian guy who interviewed me on the plane and wrote a story about it? Even he acted as if he did not know me. This is so sad. There's a clip you can watch where Sean Hannity is interviewing Donald Trump Jr. and James O'Keefe is walking around in the background trying to get in the shot for just a crumb of media attention. Look, there he is. And there he is again, pretending to be on his phone. And here, he finally manages to push his way into the interview. boy, James. But when he tries to speak, he gets shut down and ignored by his own best friends. Met with the president 47 times. And, and they're saying, oh, this never happens. I mean, yesterday, Obama's saying, this never happens. Trump should stop winning. It happened. A couple hours later, do you imagine that you... Ran on his arm, he stacked charm around your neck. Despite all this, Donald Trump winning the presidency was undeniably a huge success for James O'Keefe on election day, and it served as strong proof of the value of Project Veritas as a political action tool. On the day after the election, James posted a cheerful video where you can really see his happiness and positivity shining through. Hi, I'm James O'Keefe with Project Veritas. Perhaps the most amazing thing that happened last night was the power shift in this country. Because it isn't the politicians or the established press anymore, or the lobbyists or the pundits, but the people who have the power now. One of the great ironies of our lives is that the political class and media were not just wrong, but profoundly wrong. They will now have to face accusations of being discredited. They will have to be scrutinized. They will find themselves under a microscope of the American people, who showed they wield enormous power. I'm here to tell you that all those people are now on notice. You know who you are. You will be held accountable for your crimes and your betrayal of trust. Because we at Veritas have people embedded everywhere. We're watching you. We're talking to you. We're gaining your trust. We're learning your darkest secrets. And we are recording you. The game has changed. You are being watched. Americans, they're fed up, and we're coming after you. Facts don't support your narratives. Facts don't care about your feelings, and the eye on the sky does not lie. You don't have a monopoly on truth anymore, and you can't set the agenda. The power has shifted. The citizens have the power now, and the best part is, you know it. Stay tuned. <laughs> In the immediate aftermath of James O'Keefe releasing his DNC rigging the election videos, he was very keen for the authorities to launch a criminal investigation into the Democrats. In a fortunate turn of events, James O'Keefe's wish was granted, and the Republican Attorney General of Wisconsin, Brad Schimmel, issued a statement through his spokesperson, saying, The Attorney General is aware of these videos and very concerned about apparent violations of the law. We are evaluating and reviewing available options to address the serious questions these videos raise. The AG requested the full unedited tapes from James, which would be used to determine whether or not there was a federal case to pursue. And then, everything went quiet. Five whole months passed by, and then in April 2017, Patrick Marley from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel made a Freedom of Information request. It was because of Patrick's request that the AG's initial report on James O'Keefe's videos saw the light of day, and in the report, it was written that 
Based on all the available evidence, there was no basis to conclude that the videos demonstrated or suggested violations of Wisconsin criminal laws. Almost immediately, a video appeared on the Project Veritas YouTube channel entitled O'Keefe Confronts Wisconsin Attorney General's Unfounded Attack on Project Veritas. You remember our video on Scott Fovel and Democracy Partners back in October? Scott Fovel there pictured. He was talking about inciting violence at Trump rallies. He was also talking about busing people across state lines. So this week, the Wisconsin Attorney General finally releases their report on our videos. And it looks like they didn't even watch the raw material that we sent them. This is the report. So in this report, the AG is attacking our credibility. He's attacking the recordings. You didn't watch the tapes and you don't care to investigate. This is about politics. This is about attacking Project Veritas. But if the state of Wisconsin is not gonna do their job, then, then we should, you should be investigated. We should investigate you and you should lose your job. Scott Fobel lost his job, as did Bob Creamer back during the election. They were fired for their comments. James accuses the Attorney General of not watching his tapes. He says that the Attorney General is playing politics and threatens to investigate the Attorney General, saying he should lose his job. In this video, James tears into the content of the Attorney General's report, pointing out many examples of what he perceives to be general incompetence, political bias, and ill will towards Project Veritas. Let's have a look at the report which James is holding in his hand to find out what all the fuss is about. The first page details the specific laws and penalties which the allegations made in the Project Veritas videos correspond to. The next two pages explain the contents of James's edited DNC videos scene by scene. It's on page four that things get interesting. The report notes that the full, supposedly unedited recordings which have been provided by James O'Keefe are suspect. Let's listen to how James O'Keefe responds to this. So in this report, the AG is attacking our credibility. He's attacking the recordings. Again, it looks like he hasn't even watched the recordings we sent him. He says, quote, the supplemental recordings provided are suspect. First, there are none of the usual signs of a complete recording. He says, the recordings start in the middle of discussion. Well, that's because we don't show the video of our journalist in the parking lot. James O'Keefe exasperatedly responds that the reason the recordings start mid-discussion is because they don't need to show their journalists walking through the parking lot. And that's the end of his rebuttal to this specific point. This explanation would seem reasonable if it were not for the fact that James never felt the need to remove these parts from unedited videos which were submitted to the authorities in the past. In 2010, James O'Keefe had to provide state prosecutors in California with the full unedited videos of his acorn stings. And in these videos, you see James getting out of his car and walking through the parking lot. Because of this, as someone reviewing the video, you're given the assurance that what you're seeing is exactly what James recorded on that day, from the point where he switched his camera on to the point where he switched it off, with nothing omitted. The same thing could be said about the unedited video from the NPR sting back in 2011, which likewise shows everything that happened from the undercover reporters switching on their camera to nervously drinking wine, waiting for the targets to arrive, and then walking out the room and switching off the camera when the meeting is over. Seeing the exact star and endpoints of these unedited videos is critical because that's what gives you confidence as a legal investigator that you're not missing any important contextual information about the encounter. What's more, from reading the AG report about James's rigging the election videos, it's obvious that it's not just a walk through a car park which has been removed from the recording. The report states, the usual introductory statements of parties to a conversation are absent. In other words, James's supposedly unedited video recording never shows what was said at the start of the encounter between Craig Hartsock and Scott Fovel. James then moves on to another criticism of the AG report in his video, this time talking about the time counter on his recordings. He talks about that there is a, a gap. He says that there are inaccuracies in in the, in the time counter, well, the time counter is the thing on the upper left hand of the screen on our hidden camera. It's a ticker, it doesn't, it doesn't reflect the time of day, and that ticker resets constantly. James is incredulous at the notion that the AG's report would even mention the time counter on his recordings. Let's see what it says about the time counter in the report. The second recording contains gaps at several points. The time counter is also completely useless as it is inaccurate and changes several times in both recordings. I do not believe the recordings can be relied upon as complete or accurate. 
So basically, the time counter in James's videos appears to be exhibiting weird behavior. In response to this, James says that it's just a ticker. It resets all the time. He shows a video on screen where the ticker resets from 81,000 to zero. Nothing to worry about, James says, and it's weird that the AG is even bringing this up. The question which is useful to ask here is, in a normal situation, if a video time counter were to jump around randomly and reset itself on a video, what would that signify? The answer is that it would suggest the video had been spliced into, that someone had taken the full video and edited out parts of it which they didn't want other people to see. Do Project Veritas have some sort of different recording equipment to everyone else where the ticker is completely random and jumps around and resets all the time? No, they don't. Look at James O'Keefe's unedited Acorn video. When I scroll through the video with my mouse, you can see that the time counter progresses smoothly from 0 to 71,000 with no random jumps and no random resetting. Look at James O'Keefe's unedited NPR video, again, 0 to 200,000 with no random jumps, no random resetting. The issue of the time counter jumping around and casually resetting itself appears to only have affected the videos which James O'Keefe has submitted to the Attorney General to incriminate the Democrats. Now, this gets even weirder when you look more closely at what's actually going on on James's monitor during this section of the video where he demonstrates the ticker resetting. I would imagine that the whole point of showing the audience this is to demonstrate James's point that the ticker just resets of its own accord constantly and the ticker resetting doesn't signify anything. I would also hazard a guess that most Project Veritas viewers are not familiar with the video editing software shown on screen and don't actually understand what's going on here on James's monitor. But if they did, they would realize that what James is showing them does nothing to prove his point. This area here is the arrangement panel. This is where in a video editing program, you place different clips which you want to edit together. If James wanted to demonstrate that the ticker on his raw video constantly resets of its own accord, the best way to do this would be to show the audience one continuous uninterrupted clip on screen where the ticker resets, like this one, which I'm showing you now. This would demonstrate that the reset issue was within the raw clip rather than anything going on with the editing. But look at what's going on on James's monitor. A new video clip enters the arrangement here at the exact point where in the little window on the top right, we see the camera angle jump and the ticker reset to zero. Bafflingly, James appears to be demonstrating in real time that the ticker on his footage resets and jumps around when he makes a video edit. And he's showing you this whilst being absolutely furious at the Attorney General's office for implying that this is the case. Uh, he writes a whole bunch of gobbledygook about the recordings and how long they are. This is where James stops showing his viewers the report and says the Attorney General is writing gobbledygook about how long the videos are. The gobbledygook James is referring to is this bit, where the investigator is simply factually stating how long the videos are, what dates they were filmed on, and the materials provided with them, in a very detached, matter-of-fact tone. The investigator also knows that the transcripts which James has provided with his recordings contain errors, both in identifying the person who's speaking and the things they're saying. There is very little here which could be described as gobbledygook, it's incredibly clear, direct language. The thing which really struck me while I was watching this video of James exasperatedly waving around the paper report was how performative it all seemed. James O'Keefe's objections to the report's findings made no sense. He only managed to pull together rebuttals through completely misrepresenting the report's contents. And the TV monitor display demonstration seems to be nothing more than a performative bluff designed to substantiate a false claim to a gullible audience who might not understand how video editing software works. But James acts out these baseless criticisms with such passion and sincerity that they actually become very convincing. Eventually, we get to what I would characterize as the core argument of this video, which is a full frontal attack on the credibility of the Attorney General himself. It looks as though the Attorney General here is playing some politics. Come on, Attorney General, you're, 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 you're showing your cards here. You didn't watch the tapes and you don't care to investigate. This is about politics. This is about attacking Project Veritas because you think that our Achilles heel is our tapes and whether they're credible or not. We gave you transcripts. We gave you full transcripts. No, you didn't. But if the state of Wisconsin is not gonna do their job, then, then we should, you should be investigated. We should investigate you and you should lose your job. Scott Fobel lost his job, so shame on you and uh, stay tuned. 
James is most animated and passionate, not when he's attacking the AG's report, but when he's attacking the Attorney General himself. James delivers a diatribe to his viewers alleging that Brad Schimmel is attacking Project Veritas. He's showing his cards, he has a political agenda, and he needs to be investigated. The insinuations of political bias made by James O'Keefe in this video are strange, given that Brad Schimmel is a Republican Attorney General. The Republican Party has been alleging that Democrats are committing voter fraud for years, and Republicans have been actively seeking and prosecuting voter fraud wherever they have found it. Brad Schimmel himself has battled in court to maintain voter ID laws in his state, has decried voter fraud in Waukesha County, and has sent task forces to monitor polling booths during elections. Not only would it be completely contradictory to his past record as an attorney general to dismiss James O'Keefe's highly public tapes about voter fraud, but moreover, politically, Brad Schimmel has nothing to gain from discrediting James O'Keefe and everything to lose. In fact, fear of retaliation from James O'Keefe's audience, who were bound to become angry upon finding out that the rigging the election videos were devoid of substance, was probably what kept Brad Schimmel from making his report public for as long as he did. The date on the report shows that it was concluded in January 2017, and it was only thanks to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel's Freedom of Information request that it became public three months later in April. With this scathing tirade which casts doubt upon the motives and credibility of the Republican Attorney General, James O'Keefe draws a clear line in the sand and makes it known to Republican officials and his audience that anyone who questions the legitimacy of Project Veritas' videos are the enemy of the people, a puppet of the deep state, and James O'Keefe has the power to decry them as traitors and make them lose their jobs. The effect that James O'Keefe's words have over his audience is evident from reading the top comments under this video. Project Veritas viewers offer their own explanations for why Republican Brad Schimmel would commit political suicide by dismissing James's clearly legitimate tapes. There are commenters who think that Brad is secretly a liberal and is Republican on paper only. There are some people who think Brad has been blackmailed by Hillary Clinton and John Podesta. But the vast majority of commenters don't appear to know that Brad is a Republican and have simply assumed that he's some kind of leftist or Democrat. These reactions were exactly what James O'Keefe was hoping for, reminiscent of James's allegations that media companies were blacklisting his election videos because the media companies were scared of retaliation from Hillary Clinton's Department of Justice. This video energized Project Veritas viewers once again and rallied them to his side with a compelling narrative about the corruption and bias of the deep state. Two years later, in his book, James wrote about why he felt so compelled to respond to Brad Schimmel, and as it happens, his reasoning suggests he might be playing a bit of politics himself. For the media and the Democrats, getting the Corte report was like finding a pony under their tree on Christmas Day. They loved the new angle. When the Associated Press called my office, no doubt for a comment about how these officials were cleared of wrongdoing, I knew I had to push back immediately. In this video, James is playing a calculated media game where before the media can report on the findings of Brad Schimmel's report, he gets one step ahead of their narrative, explaining to his audience that Brad Schimmel is not to be trusted and therefore all findings of the report can be disregarded as political and baseless. And James O'Keefe's attack on the Attorney General's office didn't stop with that one video he posted on YouTube. As reported by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, James O'Keefe also took to Twitter to post the phone number and email address of the chief investigator, a tweet he has since deleted. James also mass emailed 80,000 of his followers, coordinating them to tweet at the Attorney General. I looked into the camera and I said, Attorney General, you're full of shit and I will investigate you. And, and, I sent 80,000 emails to people with a Twitter tweet. I said, please tweet the Attorney General and ask him why he's covering up the investigation. And do you know that a few hours later, the Attorney General reversed his course? Now, if Attorney Generals didn't need the popular support of their districts in order to be re-elected, this might not have been such a big deal. But as it turns out, they do. And if you're a Republican like Brad Schimmel, needing support from conservatives for re-election, being decried as a corrupt agent of the deep state by human megaphone James O'Keefe, who's tagging you on Twitter and coordinating tens of thousands of his followers to ring your office, is not something you want. So, under immense public pressure, Schimmel reopened the investigation. I think James O'Keefe might have quite aptly exposed something corrupt about the US legal system here. The fact that one political activist can use their platform to mischaracterize reports, disseminate false allegations and coordinate their followers to pressure elected officials into re-litigating cases which have already been closed, completely circumventing their legislative process, 
sets a pretty dangerous precedent for any Republican Attorney General who might publicly disagree with James O'Keefe about something in the future. One year later, Brad Schimmel's office finalizes the investigation for a second time, and after doing substantially more legwork, speaking with witnesses and re-examining the tapes, the investigation determines the exact same thing as the first time. Now we can talk about the full investigation knowing that everything has been completed and there's no more facts to come out. Most of the videos still appear to have beginning sections missing. Using James's old unedited videos as a barometer for how much time the ticker represents, it would appear to me that the amount of footage missing from the start of the recordings James provided goes from 4 minutes in one encounter to 15 minutes in another, and the report notes that the recordings start in the middle of conversations and appear to end before the conversations have run their full course. The issue with the time counter also still manifests itself. To be fair to James, in the final report it's noted that most of the time, the weird ticker behaviour does not seem to correspond to obvious gaps in conversations. However, there are other instances where it certainly does. In one of the encounters with Scott Fovel, it's noted that in the space of a second, James's recording cuts from footage of Scott wearing glasses mid-conversation to a shot of him leaning back in his chair with his glasses off. The gap in the ticker display numbers that would suggest to me that one minute of footage was removed from the recording. An interview with James's reporter, who's unnamed in the report but I'm assuming is Christian Hartsock, confirms that he hadn't had any problems with the recording which would lead to gaps in what he filmed, and that he'd submitted the full tapes unedited to James. It therefore seems very suspect that parts were missing from the recordings that ended up in the hands of the authorities. Regarding the parts of James's videos which show operatives working for the Democrats talking about sending their people to disrupt Trump rallies and provoke reactions from Trump supporters, the report's conclusion remains the same as when it was first published, that whilst this is a horrible political tactic, there is no law making such conduct illegal. There were ads made for the Trump campaign straight off the back of James's DNC videos running up to the election, which took James's video findings to their most extreme conclusion, asserting that the Democrats had paid for actual physical violence against Trump supporters. However, these allegations make pretty big logical leaps from what the Project Veritas videos actually show. There's a part of the Rigging the Election videos where Scott Fovel talks about sending provocateurs in Planned Parenthood and Hillary t-shirts with the intent of making people want to punch them. I assume it's always in the rally. initiating the conflict by having leading conversations with people who are naturally psychotic. Right. Okay, I mean, honestly, it is not hard to get some of these assholes to pop off. Right. It's, it's a matter of showing up to want to get into the rally in a Planned Parenthood t-shirt. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, Trump is a Nazi, you know, you can, you can message to draw them out mm -hmm. and draw them to punch you. There's also a part where a woman talks about her protest movement attending a Trump rally in Arizona and getting a highway shut down. And then, um, and then we also did the Arizona when we shut the highway down. Yeah. Really? It's absolutely true that the scenario the DNC staff appear to be hoping for in these videos is that Trump supporters will get so riled up from seeing their provocateurs that they will want to punch them and it will lead to coverage from the media. But to jump from this to the conclusion that every act of violence that occurred on Trump's campaign trail was paid for by DNC money is a pretty big abstraction, which is predictably exactly where Trump went with it. The report states that this type of conduct is not limited to any one party. For anyone who is skeptical about what this might look like on the Republican side, I would encourage you to think of all the times you've seen people with Trump signs at televised Clinton rallies, people with Trump signs at feminist protests, people wearing MAGA hats in liberal areas, and think to yourself whether this conduct is any different in substance to what Scott Fovel is describing in James's Project Veritas video. It's always in the rally. Initiating the conflict by having leading conversations with people who are naturally psychotic. Right. Okay, I mean, honestly, it is not hard to get some of these assholes to pop off. Right. It's, it's a matter of showing up to want to get into the rally in a Planned Parenthood t-shirt. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, Trump is a Nazi, you know, you can, you can message to draw them out mm -hmm. and draw them to punch you. Left wing or right wing, I really do view all people who engage in this activity as monumental scumbags who are a vile stain on our political landscape. Why are you upset? I don't get it. It's so scary that you guys even think this. What do you mean? 
to make America great again. Why do you be this? What are you talking about? We gotta, we gotta build a wall and make America great again. Regarding voter fraud, the report once again stands by its initial conclusion that James's recordings don't show any evidence of it being committed. The conversations remain best described as vague and theoretical in many aspects. There are no clear or direct statements indicating that voter fraud was planned or had occurred. This finding will come as no surprise to you, given that you know the manner in which James O'Keefe's reporter engineered this conversation. It revolved entirely around Christian Hartsock proposing his own illegal scheme to a drunken guy in a bar. So, of course, the drunken guy's comments don't reveal anything that's actually going on within the Democratic Party. The report also highlights facts which reveal more parts of James's videos to have been edited very deceptively. In James's edited Rigging the Election Part 2 video, we see two very short sections featuring Bob Creamer, in which he seems very receptive to a scheme to illegally register immigrants to vote. Creamer hesitated to help our donor pull off the voter fraud scheme that Fovel created. I've literally just seen this bit. He straight up lies and says that Scott Fovel created the illegal voter fraud scheme. James, you cheeky boy. Through reading the investigator's notes, what becomes clear is the manipulative role James O'Keefe's reporter played in this conversation, and the things Bob Creamer said which didn't make it into James O'Keefe's final cut. James O'Keefe's reporter stated that he thought the laws against illegal voting were too heavy-handed, and he got angry about the fact that illegal immigrants were not allowed to vote. He persistently brought up plans of illegal schemes which he wanted Bob Creamer to implement in order to register illegal immigrants to vote. In response to this, Bob Creamer repeatedly told him that voters need to be legal citizens of the United States. The investigator's notes say, Each time these suggestions of voter fraud were presented to Creamer, he did not agree to these proposals and reference voter empowerment and finding ways to legitimately have people vote for the Democratic Party. When Bob Creamer suggested legal ways to get people to vote for the Democratic Party, James O'Keefe's journalist rebuked him, saying that legal methods didn't thrill him. And remember that James's journalist was employing these tactics from a position of power in this meeting. He was the one with the money that Bob Creamer wanted to get his grabby little mitts on. Of course, none of this contextual information would have been apparent to viewers in the edited video which James O'Keefe published ahead of the 2016 election. After reading through the legal reports and James's own book, we see the Project Veritas DNC investigation take a similar shape to the ACORN investigation which James produced in 2009. The illegal voting activities which James claimed to have exposed in the DNC were schemes which had been manufactured by his own journalists, used to elicit inflammatory responses and produce useful footage for Donald Trump. For all the posturing James O'Keefe did where he demanded that his targets be investigated for serious criminal activity, he was not willing to provide full recordings to the investigators to allow them to do that job. And when questions were raised about the tampered recordings James O'Keefe had submitted, he turned the legal proceedings into a circus, tarnishing the investigators' reputations and coordinating his followers to attack them. All of this important contextual information which would have allowed viewers to make sense of what they saw in James's videos only became known years later when the videos had achieved their desired impact and the news cycle had moved on. And this meticulously coordinated effort between the Trump campaign and Project Veritas is something which you could 100% expect to see again in a few months time when Trump is up against Joe Biden in the 2020 election. Although James didn't personally receive the respect he felt he deserved from the rigged DNC videos, he certainly achieved results. James O'Keefe's company earnings skyrocketed after 2016, from around 5 million to 8 million, triple the growth that Project Veritas had seen in any previous year. In his book, James writes that the DNC videos brought Project Veritas a level of exposure and influence we dared not even hope for when we started the project. It has allowed me to expand our operations from a handful of associates into something like an investigative army. James O'Keefe also writes that when he attended an election viewing party, he had an encounter with a surrogate for the Trump campaign who said, James, you won the election for us. It's hard to pinpoint exactly the effect that James O'Keefe's DNC videos had on the 2016 election, but something which was undeniable was the fact that they lent weight to Donald Trump's previously completely unsubstantiated claims that the election was going to be rigged against him. The process is rigged. This whole election is being rigged. And I'm telling you, I have many top professionals. Don't talk about this, Donald. Nobody believes. I said, maybe some do believe it. And they're the people that also talk at length about massive voter fraud in this election. What is your reaction to these things? I've been saying for a long time, it's a rigged system. It's totally, it's just terrible what's going on. 
The assertion that the election was rigged against Trump had been a cornerstone of Trumpian rhetoric for most of his presidential campaign, up there with reprisals of build that wall and lock her up. At the start of his campaign, Trump was levying these rigging charges against his opponents in the Republican Party, at first claiming that Ted Cruz had illegally stolen Iowa votes from him, and then moving on to say that the whole Republican Party selection process was rigged against him. When the rigged Republican selection process was done and Trump won the nomination, Trump shifted his talk of rigging the election to be firmly positioned on the Democrats. His claims were mostly vague. He said that he'd heard more and more that the election was going to be rigged, without naming who exactly was saying this. Like all incendiary comments from Trump, the rigged election claims elicited a response from the media which was part confusion, part outrage, and part ridicule. Then, when James O'Keefe released his Project Veritas tapes, to Trump supporters they were a glorious vindication of everything that Trump had been claiming. The fact that an independent journalist had spontaneously appeared with footage that flipped the script and showed Trump to be on the right side of this issue for which he'd been roundly mocked and criticised was nothing less than poetic justice. The parallels between Trump's rigged election rhetoric and James O'Keefe's rigged election videos are something which not that many people have spent too long reflecting on. However, given what we now know about the level of coordination which occurred between Project Veritas and the Trump campaign, it's definitely worth mulling over. In June 2015, James O'Keefe visited Trump's campaign team and showed Trump videos he'd recorded of a small-scale sting he'd done at a Clinton rally. Before the year was up, the Trump Foundation had made two separate donations to Project Veritas, both for the value of 10000 as shown on a tax filing. It's in April 2016 that James O'Keefe's undercover reporter is pitching his scheme about busing illegal voters between states to Scott Fovel. In July of 2016, Project Veritas are meeting with Bob Creamer, who they've given a $20,000 donation to, curiously enough, the exact amount of money which they were given by the Trump Foundation. It's then in August that Donald Trump starts talking about the election being rigged strictly in terms of the Democrats being the ones behind it, and he stays on this topic all the way through the campaign. In fact, the day before James O'Keefe released his Project Veritas videos, Donald Trump put out two tweets which seemed to eerily echo the claims of DNC media coordination and voter fraud which are in the Project Veritas videos, getting reactions of outrage from the media and Democrat officials once again, which would be fresh in everyone's minds, to almost too perfectly set the scene for the Project Veritas videos to come out and vindicate him the next day. Knowing the full timeline that led to the release of the Project Veritas rigging the election videos, what is the likelihood that James O'Keefe would not have shared the content of what he'd captured with Donald Trump? Zero percent, I'd say. And if Trump knew about James's Sting video, then what we saw in 2016 was not James O'Keefe's investigation spontaneously sprouting up in support of Trump's allegations, but rather the other way round, that Trump's rhetoric was influenced by the content he knew James O'Keefe had captured for him that would be released just ahead of election day. The Trump campaign would have been fully aware that the media and Democrats would ridicule their candidate for claiming the election was rigged, and that the subsequent release of James's deceptively engineered but highly persuasive videos would completely undermine their credibility. Donald Trump is out there talking about the rigged corrupt system, and these tapes, these revelations, show exactly what he means, Sean, that somebody like Donald Trump, who the mainstream media and the moneyed folks and the entire political left don't want to be a legitimate candidate, don't want to win, they just want to destroy him. And when he talks about the rigged corrupt system, people see, I think, I think it's a very resonant message because people see right in front of them that everything's unfair. And, and they're saying, oh, this never happens. I mean, yesterday, Obama's saying, this never happens. Trump should stop whining. It happened. Of course, there is a stunning irony to all of this, which I'm sure isn't lost on James O'Keefe, in the fact that he was purporting to expose the underhanded and deceptive machinations of our political system which go on behind closed doors, whilst himself being the biggest cog in the filthy political machine. Make no mistake that the 2020 election cycle will be business as usual for James O'Keefe. He either has an undercover video right now, which he'll hold on to till October, or the sting is going on as we speak. The most prominent allegations from Trump so far appear to center around voter fraud. So at this moment in time, in summer 2020, my bet is that James will have a video revolving around that. Maybe even manufactured using the same trick as in 2016, where his undercover reporters suggest their own voter fraud plans to drunk Democrats in bars and frame the Democrats' engagement with the conversation as evidence of meticulously orchestrated sordid schemes within the Democratic Party. I would definitely keep your eyes and ears peeled for interesting intersections between the things that Trump Trump says and the videos that James O'Keefe subsequently releases. There might just be more to it than you think. 
The years surrounding the 2016 election were pivotal in many ways for James O'Keefe and Project Veritas. Having promoted his unique brand of conservative activism since he was a philosophy major at Rutgers University, James was now beginning to acquire a prominence in GOP politics that few would have previously thought possible. It's true that James provided a valuable service to Trump during the 2016 election, but I think that what is far more striking about this phase in Project Veritas history is the immense power and influence that flowed back the other way, from Donald Trump to James O'Keefe. James had always been a useful asset to Republican politicians, but due to a combination of his unusual tactics, poor judgment, and the prolific deceptions of his past videos, he'd always been forced to assume the role of an operative in the shadows, called upon when he was needed, but otherwise ignored, and never openly endorsed as a reliable source of information. But in the new era of particularly combative politics that Trump ushered in, through a series of calculated maneuvers and strategic alliances, James O'Keefe was able to earn himself a seat at the table of the highest office in the land and went from being a media oddity to a high-ranking political insider with significant power and influence. No longer did James have to watch the fallout from his videos from the sidelines, hoping that his narratives would break through into the mainstream media, because he now had a platform that was big enough and hundreds of thousands of followers who were devoted enough to pressure cable news teams into giving him the coverage he wanted. Not only this, but his status meant that it was no longer James who had to fear the results of investigations by attorney generals, but they who had to fear him as he wielded enough clout amongst their constituents that anything negative written about him in reports could be swiftly met with scathing retribution and threats to unseat people from office. From the embers of the 2016 election emerged a new James O'Keefe, one who was fundamentally unchanged in his outlook and political dogmatism, but who now had the power and populist right-wing support to deliver on his uncompromising vision for conservative politics, now with the President of the United States standing firmly by his side. Yes, yes, yes. If you're still here, thanks so much for watching my vid. I'm very pleased to have you over here on my channel. This here is a list of absolute dons who have given me money on Patreon. I really appreciate it. You could be part of this list by clicking on the Patreon link in the description of my vid. Apologies that this vid took an awful long time to make. I'm sorry about that. You may be pleased or perhaps baffled to hear that I have plenty more to talk about regarding James O'Keefe and Project Veritas, and so the next vid on this channel will be part 4 of this series. Will there be a part 5? A part 6? I don't know, it's going to take as long as it takes. I usually get a few people asking me about my beats in the comments section and where they can find them, so I will give a short explanation about this now and I hope I can rely on you who are listening to spread the word. Basically every beat that I make for my videos is a very rough loop, I get a sample, I get drums, I slap an 808, a little synth on there, I loop it and I consider it done for the video. Because of this simple process, the beats in my videos are never of the quality that I would want for proper SoundCloud uploads uh, without me going to extra efforts to develop them further and mix them down properly. Typically, I try and upload beats after I'm done with vids, but this series has taken up so much of my time that alongside my 9 to 5 stuff, I really can't think about beats until the whole thing is done, like the whole series. So out to all the tune requesters, yeah, but you've got to hang tight for probably a long while. Thanks again to everyone for watching my vid and for supporting my channel. I will catch you on the next upload. I will say bye now. Never seen a girl who hypnotize like you, like you, walk like you, like you, talk the way you do. Lately I've been plotting to slip you out those cottons. You want it, girl, you got it. I just wanna smell you rotten. Say I never seen a girl who hypnotize like you, hypnotize like you, who talk the way you talk the way you Lately I've been plotting to slip you out those cottons. You want it, girl, you got it. I just wanna smell you rotten. Quit fucking around and let's fuck around. I just wanna spoil you rotten. Quit fucking around and let's fuck around. I just wanna spoil you. Take the melancholy, mix it with my wet. Make it rain, make her get more wet. Take my chain, rep my set. Give her something that she won't forget. Awful fall, but niggas wanna stay hot. Bonfire, they friends. Ooh, fire, ooh, fire. Say they get into these ends. You liar, you liar. Circle jerking, holding hands. Kumbaya, kumbaya. Ooh, my, 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 my. You hanging with this pump of clock. Come here, kick it with your boy, baby. I got room for ya. Simpson, my, sim, my, sim, my. Got the keys to my bim, my, to my bim, my. Get you wetter than the in September, please remember I've seen a girl who hypnotized like you, like you, like walk like you, like you, who talk the way you do, the way you do. Lately, I've been plotting yeah. to slip you yeah. up those cottons. If you want it, girl, you got it. I just wanna spoil you right and say, I've never seen a girl who hypnotized like you, I'm hypnotized walk like you, who talk the way you do, the way you do. Lately, I've been plotting to slip you up those cottons. If you want it, girl, you got it. I just wanna spoil you right and quit fucking around and let's fuck around. I just wanna spoil you right and quit fucking around. Let's fuck around, I just wanna spoil you right
gas Baby, oh I'm God. too drunk to drive Won't you let me come inside? She try to make me come inside Saying shit yeah. like, woo, woo, make me numb inside And I don't know what I did yeah. Drink yeah. too much yeah. wrong